He offered to tutor me personally, and I gladly took him up on his offer. Since I'd come to the university, I'd only seen Master Linguist during admissions uh -huh. interviews and when I was brought up on the horns for disciplinary reasons. Acting as Chancellor, he was rather grim and formal. But when he wasn't sitting in the Chancellor's chair, Master Herma was a surprisingly deft and gentle teacher. He was witty with a surprisingly irreverent sense of humor. The first time he told oh, me a dirty a joke, pattern. you could have knocked me over with a feather. Elodin wasn't teaching a class this term. But I began to study naming privately under his direction. It went more smoothly now that I understood there was a method to his madness. Count Threp was overjoyed to find me alive and threw a resurrection party where I was proudly displayed to the local nobility. I had a suit of clothes tailored specifically for the event, and in a fit of nostalgia, I, I chose to have them done in the colors my old troop had worn, the green I'll and gray you. of Lord Greyfallow's men. After the party... Over a bottle of wine in his sitting room, I told Threp of my adventures. I left off the story of Felurian, as I knew he wouldn't believe it. You're not gonna get to and I end. couldn't tell him half of what I'd done in the mayor's service. Consequently, Threp thought Alvaron had been quite generous in rewarding me. I didn't argue the point. Chapter 145. Stories. Ambrose had been blessedly absent during the winter term. But when spring arrived, he came back to roost like some sort of hateful migratory bird. By no coincidence, the okay. day after he returned, I skipped all my classes and spent Here's the entire minutes. day making myself a new gram. As soon as the snow melted and the ground grew it's firm again, I resumed my practice of the K-10. Okay, I don't, I don't Remembering how odd it had looked when I'd first seen it, I did this <laughs> I in the privacy of the was. forest north of the university. Oh my God. With spring term came a new round of admissions. I showed up for my interview with a profound hangover and fumbled a few questions. My tuition was set at 18 talents and five, earning me four talents and change from the bursar. Sales of the bloodless had slackened over the winter, as there were fewer merchants visiting the university. But once snows melted and roads grew oh, dry, the handful was. that had accumulated in the stock sold quickly, bringing me another six talents. I was unused to having so much money at my disposal, and I'll admit, I went a little mad with oh. it. I owned six suits of clothes that fit me and had all the paper I could use. I bought fine, dark ink from Arua and purchased my own set of engraving tools. I had two pairs of shoes. Two! I found an ancient, ragged Yilish dictum buried in a bookstore in Imre. Full of drawings of knots, the bookstore owner thought it was a sailor's journal, and I bought it Me for too, a mere Claudia. talent I and a half. Not long I after, 19, I bought it. a copy of the Hurroborica, then added a copy of Termagus uh, Technica I could use as a reference while designing schema in the privacy of my own room. I bought I dinner for this. my friends. Ari had new dresses and bright ribbons for her hair. All this and still money in my purse. How odd. How wonderful. Toward the middle of the term, I began to hear familiar stories. Stories about a certain red-haired adventurer who had spent the night with Felurian. Stories of a dashing young arcanist with all the powers of Taberlin the Great. It had taken months, but my exploits in Vintus had finally passed their way from mouth to ear all the long miles back to the university. It may be true that when I finally became aware of these stories, I lengthened my shade a bit, and wore it more often than before. It might also be the case that I spent a shameful amount of time in alehouses over the next several span, lurking quietly, listening to stories. Read it. I might even have gone so far as to offer a suggestion or two. I was young, after all, and it was only natural for me to delight in my notoriety. I thought it would fade in time. Why shouldn't I revel a bit in the sidelong glances my fellow students made? Why not enjoy it while it lasted? Many of the stories centered around me hunting bandits and rescuing young girls. But none of them came terribly close to the truth. No story can move a thousand miles by word of mouth and keep its shape. While the details differed, most of them followed a familiar thread. Young women were in need of rescuing. Sometimes a nobleman hired me. Sometimes it was a concerned father, a distraught mayor, or a bumbling constable. Most of the time, I saved a pair of girls. Sometimes, only he one. one shot Sometimes, there were three. They were best friends. They were mother and daughter. 
I heard one story where there were seven of them, all sisters, all beautiful princesses, all virgins. You know that sort one of story. Fucking bullet and it did there was a great damage? deal of variety as to who exactly I was rescuing the girls from. Bandits were fairly common, but there were also wicked uncles, stepmothers, and shamblemen. better. One story, in an odd twist, had me rescuing them from ADEM mercenaries. There was even an ogre or two. While I did occasionally rescue There's the girls demon, from a troop of traveling players, I'm proud to say I never heard a story where they were kidnapped by the Edema Rue. The story generally had one of two endings. In the first, I leapt to the battle like Prince Gallant and fought sword on sword until everyone was dead, fled, or appropriately repentant. Oh, yeah. The second ending was more popular. It involved me calling down fire and lightning from the sky after the fashion of Taberlin the Great. In my favorite version you know, of the story, I met a helpful spot, tinker on the road. I shared Honestly, my dinner, and he told me of two place, children I, stolen I, from a nearby farm. Before I left, he sold me an egg, three so iron nails, size. and a shabby cloak that could render me invisible. I used the Great. items and my considerable wit to save the children from the clutches Great. of a cunning, hungry trow. But while there were many versions like, of that tale... The story of Felurian was more popular by far. Was ever the song I'd written had made the journey west as well. And since songs hold their shape better than wait. stories, the details about oh, my encounter wait. with Felurian were moderately close to the truth. When is Will and Sim wash? pressed me for details, I told like them the really whole story. The game, you're filthy? It took me oh, a while to filthy. convince them I was telling the truth. Rather, it took me a while to convince then, Sim. Not anymore, for some reason, it's, Will it's, was perfectly willing to accept the existence of the Fae. I didn't blame Sim. Until I saw her, I would have bet solid money Felorian didn't exist. It's one thing to enjoy a story, but it's quite another to take it for the truth. The real question, Sim said thoughtfully, is how old you really are. I know that one, Willem said with the somber pride of someone desperately pretending to not be drunk. Seventeen. Ah, Sim held up a finger dramatically. You'd think so, wouldn't you? What are you talking about? I asked. Sim leaned forward in his chair. You went into the Fey, spent some time there, then came out to discover only three days had passed, Sim said. Does that mean you're only three days older? Or did you age while you were there? I was quiet for a moment. I hadn't thought of that. I admitted. I, how does that In happen stories, to me? Willem said, boys go into Fey and return as men. That implies one grows older. If you're going to go by stories, Sim said. What else? Will asked. Will you consult Marlock's Compendium of Fey Phenomenon? Find me such a book and I will reference it. Sim gave hey, an agreeable how? shrug. How does so, that possibly happen? Will said, Where turning to me. One, How long were you there? Third party to buy a full three That's man that hard to figure, through. I Holy said. Shit, nice. There wasn't any day or night, and my memories are a bit odd. I thought for a long moment. We talked, swam, ate dozens upon dozens of times, explored a bit, and, well... I paused to clear my throat meaningfully. With the fucking hundred dollar donation. Suggested Will. Thank you. And cavorted quite a bit as well. I counted the skills the Felorian fuck? had taught me, and then figured she couldn't have I taught me more than winning. two or three a day. I gotta start winning, bro. It was at I'm, least a I'm couple months, I said. Fuck? I shaved once. Or was it twice? Time Jesus, enough for me so to grow much, a bit of a beard. Damn. Will rolled his eyes at this running his hand over his own dark sealedish beard. He makes milk. Nothing like your marvelous face bear, I said. Jesus Still, nice. Thank you so mine much. grew out at least two fuck? or three times. I don't even remember what so, I was angry about. at least two months, Sim said. <laughs> but how long could it have been? God damn. Three months? How many stories had we shared? Four or five months? I thought of how slowly we'd had to move my shade from starlight to moonlight to firelight. A year? I thought about the wretched time I'd spent recovering from my encounter with the Cathay. I'm sure it couldn't have been more than a year. My voice didn't sound nearly as convincing as I would have liked. 
Willem raised an eyebrow. Well then, happy birthday. He lifted his glass to me. Or birthdays, depending. If you guys could have one supercar, what would Chapter it be? Chapter 146. You can't just say the Failures. most expensive one because you're going to sell it. That's stupid. I'll have to say that. During spring term, I experienced I like I several failures. Supercar. The first of these was mostly a failure in my own eyes. I had expected that picking Bugatti, up Yilish right? would be like relatively Chiron? easy, oh my God. but what nothing could have been car. further from the truth. From McLaren. In a handful well, of days, McLaren. I had learned mm -hmm. enough Tema to defend McLaren's myself in court. Nice. But Tema was a very orderly you know, language, you know, and I'd already mean. known a little bit from my studies. Perhaps, GTR? most importantly, there was a great on, deal of overlap been, between and, Tema and Aturum. Got more they use the same nicer. characters for writing, and many words are related. Yilish shared nothing with Aturin, or Shaldish, or even with Ademic for that matter. It was an irrational, tangled mess. Fourteen indicative verb tenses, bizarre formal inflections of address. You couldn't Dude, merely say, the Chancellor like sucks. To oh no, today, and it's the too gun. simple. <clears throat> All ownership was oddly dual. As if the Chancellor owned his socks, but at the, the same time, live? the socks somehow the also Martin gained ownership of the Chancellor. Of oh, well, yeah, you're this altered the use of both scenario. words in complex grammatical ways, as Everybody if the simple act of so owning good. socks somehow fundamentally changed the nature of a person. So even after months of study so with the Chancellor, the Yilish grammar was still a muddy jumble to me. You sure? You All I had to show for my car. work was a messy smattering of or, vocabulary. No, 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 it's not. My understanding uh, of the Tony story say? knots was even worse. I tried to improve matters by practicing with Diak, but he wasn't much of a teacher and admitted the only person he'd ever known who could read story knots had been his grandmother, who had died when he was very young. Second came my failure in advanced chemistry, taken under Mandrag's Giller, Anisat. While the material fascinated me, I did not get along with Anisat Isn't himself. Isn't Bugatti supposed to be one of the fastest cars? I loved the discovery chemistry offered. Are you sure that... I loved the thrill of the experiment, the challenge of trial and retrial. I loved the puzzle of it. I also will admit a somewhat foolish fondness toward the apparatus involved. The bottles and tubes, the acids and salts, the mercury and flame. There is something primal in chemistry, something that defies explication. Either you feel it or you don't. Our modding is a thing. Anisat didn't yeah, feel like, it. Right, For him, chemistry was written thing, journals right? like, and carefully penned rows of numbers. He would make me perform the same that's, titration that's like four easy. times simply like because my no notation was incorrect. Like Why write a number down? Why Isn't should I take ten minutes to, like to write what my hands fast? could finish in five? So we argued. Gently at first, like I seem to but neither of us were willing like to back down. As a result, barely two span into the term, we ended up shouting at each other in the middle of the crucible while 30 students looked on, open-mouthed with dismay. He told me to leave his class, calling me an irreverent dinnerling with no respect for authority. I called him a pompous slipstick who had missed his true fast, calling right? as a counting house scribe. In all fairness, we both yeah, had some I'm valid sure points. Bugatti would fuck it. My other failure came the in Bugatti's mathematics. Really fucking fast. After listening to Fella chatter excitedly for months about what she was learning under Master Brandur, I set out to further my number lore. Unfortunately, the loftier peaks of mathematics did not delight me. I am no poet. I do not love words for the sake of words. I love words for what they can accomplish. <clears throat> Similarly, I am no arithmetician. Numbers that speak only of numbers are of little interest to me. Due to my abandonment of chemistry and arithmetic, I had a great deal of free time on my hands. I feel like if you Some of this I spent in the fishery, enough, making a bloodless of my own that sold be practically before it hit the shelves. I also spent a fair amount of time There's in the archives and the Medica, doing research for an essay titled On the Non-Efficacy of Arrowroot. Arwill was skeptical, but agreed my initial research warranted attention. I also spent some of my time romantically, it was a new experience for me, as I had never caught the eye of women before. Or if I had, I hadn't known what to do with the attention. But I was older now, and wiser to some degree. And because of the stories circulating, women on both sides of the river were beginning to show an interest in me. My romances were all pleasant and brief. I cannot say why brief, except to state the obvious, that I do not have much in me that might encourage a woman to make long habit of my company. Simon, for example, had a great deal to offer. He was a gemstone in the rough, 
not stunning at first glance, but with a great deal of worth beneath the surface. Sim was tender, kind, and attentive as any woman could care for. He made Fella deliriously happy. Sim was a prince. By contrast, what did I have to offer? Nothing, really. Less now. I was more like a curious stone that is picked up, carried a while, and finally dropped again with the realization that for all its interesting look, it is nothing more than hardened earth. Master Kilvin, I asked, can you think of a metal that will stand hard use for two thousand years and remain relatively unworn or unblemished? The huge artificer looked up from the brass gear he was inscribing and eyed me standing in the doorway of his office. And what manner of project are you planning now, Lark Wolf? In the last three months, I've been trying to create like another cars, schema like I, as successful like I as my bloodless. Car person, you Partly know? for the money, like I don't know but also because I'd learned that Kilvin was much more likely to promote students with three or four impressive schema to their credit. Unfortunately, I had met with a string of failures here, too. I'd had more than a dozen clever ideas, none of which had led to a finished design. Most of the ideas were struck down by Kilvin okay. himself. Eight of my clever ideas had already been created, some of them more than a hundred years ago. Five of them, Kilvin informed me, would require the use of runes that were forbidden to Rilar. Three of them were mathematically unsound, and he quickly sketched out how they were doomed to failure, saving me dozens of hours of wasted time. One of my ideas he rejected as utterly inappropriate for a responsible artificer. I argued that a mechanism that would cut the time needed to reload a ballista would help ships defend against piracy. It would help defend towns against attack by V-Sembi raiders. But Kilvin would hear none of it. When his face began to grow dark as a storm cloud, that I quickly really abandoned my carefully planned arguments. With an arc In the star. end, only two of my ideas were sound, acceptable, and original. But after weeks of work, I was forced to abandon them as well unable to get them to work. Kilvin set down his stylus and half-inscribed brass gear, turning to face me. It's not diesel, baby. I admire it's a diesel. student who thinks in terms of durability, Relark Foth, but a thousand years is a great deal to ask of stone, let alone metal, to say nothing of metal put to heavy use. I was asking about Sisura, of course, but I hesitated to tell Kilvin the full truth. I knew all too well that the Master Artificer did not approve of artificery being used in conjunction with any sort of weapon. While he might appreciate the craftsmanship of such a sword, he would not think well of me for owning such a thing. I smiled. It isn't for a project, I said. I was just curious. During my travels, I was shown a sword that was quite serviceable and sharp. Despite this, there seemed to be proof that it was over two thousand years old. Do you know of any metal that could avoid breaking for so long as that, let alone keep an edge? Ah. Right, 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 right. Kilvin nodded, his expression not particularly surprised. There are such things, old magics, one could say. Or old arts now lost to us. These things are scattered through the world. Marvelous devices, mysteries. There are many reliable there. sources that speak of the ever-burning lamp. He gestured with a broad hand at the oh, hemispheres of glass laid out on his work table. We even possess a handful of these things here at the university. I felt my curiosity flare up. What sort of things? I asked. Kilvin tugged his beard idly with one hand. I have a device devoid of any sigildry that seems to do nothing but consume angular momentum. I have four ingots of white metal, lighter than water, that I can neither melt nor mar in any way. A sheet of black glass, one side of which lacks any frictive properties at all. A piece of oddly shaped stone that maintains a temperature slightly above freezing, no matter what the heat around it. His massive shoulders shrugged. These things are mysteries. I opened my mouth, then hesitated. Would it be inappropriate for me to ask to see some of these things? Wait. Kilvin's smile was very white against the dark of his skin and his beard. It is see, never man. inappropriate to ask, Relark Wolf. 
he said. A student Friend, should be I, curious. Be playing, uh, I would I, I be troubled if like you were indifferent to such things. Apparently. The big artificer went to his large wooden desk, so strewn with half-finished projects that the surface was barely visible. He unlocked a drawer with a key from his pocket and drew out two dull metal cubes, slightly larger than dice. Many of these old things we cannot fathom or make use of, he said, but some possess remarkable utility. He rattled the two metal cubes as if they were dice, and they rang together sweetly in his hand. We call these warding stones. He bent and set them on the floor, spaced several feet apart from each other. He touched them truck. and spoke oh, very softly people? under his breath, too yes, quietly sir. for me to hear. I felt a subtle change in the air. At first, I thought that the room was oh, growing colder, but then I realized the truth. Uh -oh. I couldn't feel the radiant heat of the smoldering forge at the other end of Kilvin's office. Kilvin casually picked up the bar of iron used to stir the forge and swung it hard at my head. His gesture was so casual I'm that it caught me completely off my guard and I didn't even have time to cower or definitely flinch away. Bar the bar stopped two feet away from me, as if striking some well, unseen obstruction. But trucks aren't like that There was fast, no sound yeah. as if it had struck something, neither did it rebound in Kilvin's grip. I reached out my hand cautiously, and it butted up against... Where am I supposed to go? Nothing. Containment, I guess? It was as if the intangible air in front of me was suddenly made solid. Kilvin grinned at me. The warding stones are of particular use when Dude, performing dangerous truck, experiments bro, think, or oh, testing certain equipment, he said. They somehow produce a thalmic and kinetic barrier. I continued to run my hand along the unseen barrier. It wasn't hard <laughs> or even solid. It gave way slightly when I pushed at it and felt slippery as buttered glass. Kilvin watched me, his expression faintly amused. Truthfully, Relarkvoth, until Eloden made his suggestion, I was thinking of calling your arrow-arresting device the Minor Ward. He frowned slightly. Not entirely accurate, of course, but more so than Eloden's dramatic nonsense. I leaned hard against the unseen barrier. It was solid as a stone wall. Now that I was looking more closely, I could see a subtle distortion in the air as if I were looking through a slightly imperfect sheet of glass. This is far superior to my arrow catch, Master Kilvin. True! Kilvin no. gave a conciliatory nod and bent to pick up the stones, muttering again under his breath. I staggered a little when the barrier disappeared. But your cleverness we can repeat endlessly. This mystery we cannot. Kilvin held up the two cubes of metal on the palm of his huge hand. These are useful, but never forget. An Cleverness and caution profit the artificer. Level we do three. our work in the realm of the real. He closed Please. his fingers over the yep. warding stones. Uh, Leave mystery to poets, trust, priests, and players fools. That are not at least like level five Despite my other failures, my study with Mastery Loden was progressing rather well. He claimed all I needed to improve myself as a namer was time Those and dedication. I gave yeah, him both, like, and he put them to use in odd ways. Take we face. spent hours riddling. On, like, he made me drink a if pint of applejack, then read Tecum's Theophany from cover to cover. He oh, made me wear a win. blindfold for three days straight, which didn't improve my performance in my other classes, but amused Will and Sim to no end. He encouraged me to see how long I could stay awake, and since I could afford all the coffee I liked, I managed nearly five days. Though, by the end, I was rather manic and starting to hear voices. And oh, there was the incident on the roof of the archives. Everyone has heard about that in one version or another, it seems. There was a great beast of a thunderstorm rolling in, and Elodin decided it would do me good to spend some time in the middle of it. The closer, the better, he said. He knew no, Lauren like would never allow us really access yeah. to the roof of the archives, so Elodin simply stole the key. Unfortunately, that meant that when the key went tumbling off the roof, no one knew we were trapped up Dude, there. The car is just gonna be As a result, the, the two of us were forced to spend the entire night on the bare stone rooftop, caught in the teeth of the furious storm. 
It wasn't until mid-morning that the weather calmed enough for us to call down to the courtyard for help. Then, as there didn't seem to be a second key, Lauren took the straightest course and had several burly scribs simply batter down the door leading to the roof. None of this would have been a particular problem if, just as it had started to rain, Elodin hadn't insisted that we strip ourselves naked, wrap our clothes in an oil skin, and weigh them down with a brick. According to Elodin, it would help me experience the storm to the fullest degree possible. The winds were stronger than he'd expected, and they had snatched both the brick saved. and our bundled clothes, hurling them into the sky like a handful of leaves. That was how we lost the key, you see. It had been in the pocket of Elodin's pants. Because of this, Master Lauren, Lauren's giller, Distral, and three brawny scribs found Elodin and me stark naked and wet as drowned rats on the roof of the archives. Within fifteen minutes, everyone in the university had heard the story. Elodin laughed his head off at the whole thing. And though I can see the humor of it now, at the time, you know, like, I was far from why amused. Why does this happen every time I play pubs? I'm fighting I won't burden you time. with the entire Let's list go. of our activities. Suffice to That's say that Elodin went trying. to great lengths really to wake my, my sleeping mind. Have a good Ridiculous time. lengths, really. Pubs are fucking and much to my surprise, our work paid dividends. I called the name of the wind three times that term. The first time, I stilled the wind for the space you of a long breath like, while standing on Stonebridge in the middle of the night. Elodin was there, coaching me. By which, I mean he was prodding me with a riding crop. I was also uh, barefoot, and more than slightly drunk. Three hours. The second time came on me so unexpectedly while on? I was studying in tomes. I was reading a book of Yillish history when suddenly the air in the cavernous room whispered to me. I listened as Elodin had taught me, then spoke it gently. Just as gently, the hidden wind stirred into a breeze, startling the students and yeah, sending the scribs into a panic. That's bad. The name faded from my mind some minutes later, but while it lasted, bad. I held the certain knowledge evil? that yes. should I wish it, See, I could thing. stir a storm or start a thunderclap <laughs> with equal ease. The knowledge know itself had to like be that. enough for me. If I had called the wind's name strongly in the archives, Lauren would have me hung by my thumbs above the outer doors. You may not think these terribly impressive feats of naming, and I suppose you are right. But I called the wind a third time that spring, and third time pays for all. Chapter 147. Debts. Yeah, Since I had a great deal of free time on my hands midway through the term, yeah, like really cool. I hired the use oh, of a two-horse fetter cart and headed oh, no. to Tarbian One on a bit of a lark. It took me all of reaving to get there and I spent most of kindling visiting old haunts and paying old debts. A cobbler who had been kind to a shoeless boy. An innkeeper who had let me sleep on his hearth some nights. A tailor I had terrorized. Parts of Waterside were strikingly familiar, while other pieces I didn't recognize at all. That didn't particularly surprise me. A city as busy as Tarbian is constantly changing. What did surprise me was the strange nostalgia I felt for this place oh, that had been so cruel to me. I had been gone for two years. For all practical purposes, it was a lifetime ago. It had been a span of days since the last rain, and the city was dry as a bone. The shuffling feet of a hundred thousand people kicked up a cloud of fine dust that filled the city streets. It covered my clothes and got in my hair and eyes, making them itch. I tried not to dwell on the fact that it was mostly pulverized horse shit with an assortment of dead fish, coal smoke, and urine thrown in for flavor. If I breathed through my nose, I was assaulted with the smell. But if I breathed through my mouth, I could taste it, and the dust filled my lungs, making me cough. Mouty. I didn't remember it being as bad as this. Wait, Had it always been here. so dirty here? Had it always smelled this bad? After half an hour of searching, I finally no found shot. the burned-out building with a basement underneath. Just like one of the I made my way down areas. the stairs and through the long hallway to a damp room. Trappist was still oh. there, barefoot and wearing the same tattered robe, tending to his hopeless children in the cool dark below the city streets. Oh, should I? He recognized me. Not as other it? people would. Not as a budding hero out of stories. Trappist had no time for such things. He remembered me as the smudgy, starveling boy who fell down his stairs, fever-sick and crying one winter night. 
You could say I loved him even more for that. I gave him as much money as he would take, five talents. I tried to give him more, but he refused. If he spent too much money, he said, it would attract the wrong sort of attention. He and his children were safest if nobody noticed them. I bowed to his wisdom and spent the remainder of the day helping him. I pumped water and fetched bread. Absolutely not. I made a quick examination of the children, then took a trip to an apothecary and brought back a few things that would help. Lastly, I tended to Trappist himself, at least as much as he would allow. I rubbed his poor, swollen feet with camphor and mother's leaf, then made him a gift of tight-fitting stockings and a good pair of shoes so he wouldn't have to go barefoot in the damp of the basement anymore. As the afternoon faded into evening, ragged children began to arrive in the basement. They came looking for a bit of food or because they were hurt and hoping for a safe place to sleep. They all eyed me suspiciously. My clothes were new and clean. I didn't belong there. I didn't know I wasn't that when welcome. I created the name. If I stayed, there would be trouble. At the very least, my presence would make some of the starveling children so uncomfortable they wouldn't stay the night. So I said goodbye to Trappis and left. Sometimes, leaving is the only thing you can do. Since I had a few hours before the tavern started to fill up, I bought a single piece of creamy writing paper and a matching envelope of heavy parchment. They were extremely fine quality much nicer than anything I'd ever owned before. Next, I found a quiet cafe and ordered drinking chocolate with a glass of water. I arranged the paper on the table and brought out pen and ink from my shade. Then, I wrote in an elegant, fluid script. Ambrose, the child is yours. You know it is true and so do I. I, I fear I my family will disown me. If you do not behave as a gentleman and see to your obligations, I will go to your father and tell him everything. Do not test me in this. I am resolved. I didn't sign a name, merely wrote oh. a single initial, which could Why have been me? an ornate R or perhaps a shaky B. Then, dipping my finger into my glass of water, I let several drops fall onto the page. They swelled the paper a bit like, and smeared the ink slightly before I blotted them oh, away. Shit. They made a fair approximation of teardrops. I let one final heavy drop fall onto the initial I'd signed, obscuring it even more. Now the letter looked as if it could also be an F, or a P, or an E, perhaps even a K. Okay, so let me get this straight. It could be anything, really. A team I folded the paper carefully, then walked Doesn't over to one of the room's wants. lamps and melted a generous blob of sealing wax onto the fold. Can I get pushed? On the outside of the envelope, I wrote, Ambrose Jackis, University, two miles west of Imre, Bellany Baron, Central Commonwealth. Even the grenade thing. It's the fact that there was I paid for my drink and headed to Drover's lot. Was. Well, when I was just a few me. streets away, I removed oh, my shade and tucked it into my travel sack. Then I dropped the letter in the street and stepped on it, scuffing it around with my foot a bit before pubs. picking it up and brushing it off. I don't know if I can play pubs. I was almost to the square when I saw the final thing I needed. Hoy there, I said to an old whiskery man sitting against a building. I'll give you half penny if you let me borrow your hat. The old man pulled the draggled thing off and looked at it. His head was very bald and very pale thing. underneath. He squinted a bit in the late afternoon sunlight. My hat? He asked, his voice rough. You can have it for a whole penny, and my blessing too. He gave a hopeful grin as he held out a thin, oh, shaky play. hand. You know I gave him a penny. Play. Could you hold this for a Wait, second? What if you up Luda? I passed him the envelope, then used both hands to screw nice. the old, the shapeless hat up. down over my ears. That's a flag. I used a nearby shop window to make sure every scrap of my red hair was tucked away underneath. Suits you, the old man said, giving a phlegmy cough. I reclaimed the letter and eyed the smudgy fingerprints he'd left. From there, it was a quick step to Drover Square. I slouched a bit and narrowed my eyes as I wandered through the milling throng. After a couple minutes, my ear caught the distinctive sound of a southern vintage accent, well, and I walked means, over to a handful of men loading a wagon with burlap like a sacks. Language, not English. Oi, I said, putting on the same accent. You folk heading up Imre Way? One of the men heaved his sack into the wagon and walked over, dusting off his hands. Heading through there, he said. You looking for a ride? I shook my head and brought the letter out of my travel sack. I've got a letter for up that way. 
I was going to take it myself, but my ship sails tomorrow. I bought it from a sailor off in Gannery for a full quarter bit, I said. He had it himself off some noble gal for a single bit, I winked. She was quite urgent that it get to him, I hear. You paid a quarter bit, the man no said, bad. already shaking his head. Yeah, grummer. Ain't nobody gonna pay that much for a letter. Hi, man. Eh, I said, holding up a finger. You ain't Tell seen who it's for yet. I, need I held it up for him to see. He squinted. Jackies, he said slowly. Then his face lit with recognition. Is that Baron Jackis's boy, then? I nodded smugly. The eldest himself. Boy rich as that should pay a fair piece for a letter from his lady. Much as whole noble, I figure. He eyed the letter. Could be, he said cautiously. But look, it ain't got anything on it other than university. I ain't been up that way. That ain't a small place. Baron Jackis's boy ain't going to sleep in a tin shack, I said crossly. Ask someone what the fanciest place is. That's where he'll be. The man nodded to himself, his hand creeping right. unconsciously I toward his purse. I suppose I could take it off your hands, around. he said grudgingly. But only at a quarter bit. I'm taking a risk anyways at that. Have a heart now, I protested pitifully. I brought it 800 miles. That's worth better than nothing. Not not Fine, he said, pulling coins out of his purse. I'll give you three bits then. I'd take half a round, at the same time? I grumbled. You'll take three bits, he said, holding out a grubby hand. Oh, I handed him the letter. Remember to tell him it's from a noble lady, I said as I turned to leave. Yes, but I'm not allowed Rich to Tosh, her. get whatever you can off him, that's what I say. I left the square, then straightened my shoulders and took off the hat. Missing I pulled my shade back out of my travel today. sack and swirled it easily around my shoulders. I started to whistle, and as I passed the bald I old beggar, I returned his hat and gave him the three bits besides. When yeah, I first I heard the stories people cheap. were telling about me at the university, I had expected them to be short-lived. I thought they would flare up, then die just as quickly, like a fire exhausting its fuel. Mass. But that hadn't been the case. The tales of Quoth rescuing girls and betting Felurian mixed and mingled with scraps of truth and the ridiculous lies I'd spread to bolster my reputation. There was fuel aplenty, so the stories swirled and spread like a brush fire with the wind blowing hard behind it. Honestly, I didn't know if I should be amused or alarmed. When I went to Imre, people would point at me and whisper to each other. My notoriety spread until it was impossible for me to casually cross the river and eavesdrop on the stories people told. Tarbian, on the other hand, was 40 oh, miles away. After I left Dude, Drover's so lot behind, right I returned now. to the room I'd rented in one of the nicer parts of Tarbian. In this part of the city, the wind off the ocean brushed away the stink and the dust, leaving the air feeling sharp and clear. I called up water for a bath, hair? and in a fit of lavish spending that would have left my younger yeah, self I dizzy, I paid three I pennies throat. to have the porter take my clothes to the nearest sealedish laundry. Then, clean and sweet-smelling again, I went down to the tap room. I'd picked the inn carefully. It wasn't fancy, I know, I but it wasn't in. seedy either. Like missing by like the tap millimeters. room was low-ceilinged and intimate. It sat at the corner of two of Tarbian's most well-traveled roads, and I could see sealedish traders rubbing elbows with yillish sailors and vintish wagoneers. It was the perfect place for stories. It wasn't long before I was lurking at the end of the bar, listening to how I had killed the black beast of Traban. I was stunned. I had actually killed a rampaging Dracus in Traban, but when Nina had hey, come hey, to hey, visit hey. me a year ago, miss more, miss more. she hadn't known my name. Man, bro, I'm My fast. growing reputation had somehow swept through the town of Traben and gathered up you know, that story in its deep, wake. There at the like, bar, you know, I learned get, many things. Hey, Apparently, I owned a you ring of get, amber get, which could force demons you know, to obey get, me. Get, I could drink you know, all get, night and get, never be the worse hey. for it. Locks opened at the barest touch of my hand, and I had a cloak made all out of cobwebs and shadows. 
That was also the first time I heard anyone call me, quote, the arcane. About which it was not a new name, apparently. The cluster of men listening to the story simply nodded along when they heard it. I learned that Quoth the Arcane knew a word that would stop arrows dead in the air. Quoth the Arcane only bled if the knife that cut him was made of raw, untempered iron. The young clerk was building to the dramatic finish of the story, and I was genuinely curious as to how I was going to stop the demon beast with my ring shattered and my cloak of shadows nearly burned away. But just as I forced my way into Traben's church, shattering the door with a magic word and a single blow of my bare hand, the door of the inn burst open, startling everyone as it banged hard against the wall. A young couple stood there. The woman was young and beautiful, dark-haired and dark-eyed. The man was richly dressed and pale with panic. I don't know what's the matter, he cried, looking about wildly. We were just walking, and then she couldn't breathe. I was at her side before anyone else in the room had time to stand. She had half collapsed onto an empty bench, with her escort hovering over her. She had one hand pressed against her chest, while the other pushed him away weakly. The man ignored it and crowded close to her, speaking in a low, urgent voice. The woman kept sliding away from him until she was at the edge of the bench. I pushed him ungently aside. I think she wants her space from you right now. Who are you? He demanded, his voice shrill. Are you a physician? Who is this man? Someone fetch a physician at once! He tried to elbow me aside. You! I pointed to a large sailor sitting at a table. Take this man and put him over there! My voice snapped like a whip, and the sailor jumped to his feet, grabbed the young gentleman by the back of his neck, and scuffed him tidily away. I turned back to the woman and watched as her perfect mouth opened. She strained and drew in only the barest rasp of a breath. Her eyes were wild and wet with fear. I moved close to her and spoke in my gentlest tones. You will be fine. All is well, I reassured her. You need to look in my eyes. Her eyes fixed on mine, then widened in recognition, in amazement. What did I just get shot by? I need you to breathe for me. I laid one hand against her straining chest. Her skin was flushed and hot. Her heart was thrilling like a frightened bird. I laid my other hand along her face. I looked deeply into her eyes. So... They were like dark pools. I leaned close enough to kiss her. She smelled of cellus flower, of green grass, of road dust. I felt her strain to breathe. I listened. I closed my eyes. I heard the whisper of a name. I spoke it soft, but close enough to brush against her lips. I spoke it quiet, but near enough so that the sound of it went twining through her hair. I spoke it hard and firm and dark and sweet. There was a rush of indrawn air. I opened my eyes. The room was still enough that I could hear the velvet rush of her second desperate breath. I relaxed. She laid her hand over mine, over her heart. I need you to breathe for me, she repeated. That's seven words. It is, I said. My hero, Dennis said, and drew a slow and smiling breath. It were powerful strange, I heard the sailor say on the other side of the room. There was summit in his voice. I swear by all the salt in me, I felt like a puppet with my string pulled. I listened with half an ear. I guessed the deckhand simply knew to jump when a voice with the proper ring of authority told him to. But there was no sense in telling him that. My performance with Denna, combined with my bright hair and dark cloak, had identified me as Kvothe. So it would be magic, no matter what I had to say about it. I didn't mind. What I had done tonight was worthy of a story or two. Because they recognized me, folk were watching us, but not coming very close. Denna's gentleman friend had left before we thought to look for him. So the two of us enjoyed a certain privacy in our small corner of the tap room. I should have known I'd come across you here, she said. You're always where I least expect to find you. Have you migrated away from the university at last? I shook my head. I'm playing truant for a couple days. Are you heading back soon? Tomorrow, actually. I've got a fetter cart. 
She smiled. Would you like some company? I gave her a frank look. You must know the answer to that. Denna blushed a little and looked away. I suppose I do. When she looked down, her hair cascaded off her shoulders, falling around her face. It smelled warm and rich, like sunshine and cider. Your hair, I said. Lovely. Surprisingly, she blushed even deeper at this and shook her head without looking up at me. So that's what we've come to after all this time, she said, darting a look up at me. Flattery? It was my turn to be embarrassed, and I stammered. I... I wouldn't... I mean, I would. I took a breath before reaching out to lightly touch a narrow, intricate braid, half hidden in her hair. Sorry, Doug. Your braid, I clarified. It almost says, lovely. Her mouth made a perfect O of surprise, and one hand went self-consciously to her hair. You can read it? She said, her voice incredulous, her expression slightly horrified. Merciful Taylu, isn't there anything you don't know? I've been learning Yilish, I said, or trying to. It's got six strands instead of four, but it's almost like a story knot, isn't it? Almost, she said. It's a damn sight more than almost. Her fingers plucked at the piece of blue string at the end of her braid. Even Yilish folk barely know Yilish these days, she said under her breath, plainly irritated. I'm not any good, I said. I just know some words. Even the ones that do speak it don't bother with the knots. She glared sideways at me. And you're supposed to read them with your fingers, not by looking at them. I've mostly had to learn by looking at pictures in books, I said. Denna finally untied the blue string and began to unfurl the braid, her quick fingers smoothing it back into her hair. You didn't have to do that, I said. I liked it better before. That's rather the point, isn't it? She looked up at me, tilting her chin proudly as she shook out her hair. There. What do you think now? I think I'm afraid to give you any more compliments, I said, not exactly sure what I'd done wrong. Her demeanor softened a bit, her irritation fading. It's just embarrassing. I never expected anyone to be able to read it. How would you feel if someone saw oh, you wearing shit. a sign that said, I'm dashing and handsome? There was a pause. Before it could grow uncomfortable, I said, Am I keeping you from anything pressing? I'm dead. Only Squire Strahota. She made a negligent gesture toward her departed escort. Pressing, was he? I gave a half-smile, raising an eyebrow. All men press one way or another, she said with mock severity. They're still keeping to their book, then? Denna's expression grew rueful, and she sighed. I used to hope they'd disregard the book with age. Instead, I found they merely turned a page. She held up her hand, displaying a pair of rings. Now instead of roses, they give gold. And in the giving, they grow sudden bold. At least you're being bored by men of means, I said consolingly. Who wants a mean man? She pointed out. Little matter if his wealth is above or below the board. I laid a gentling hand on her arm. You must forgive these men of mercenary thought. These poor, rich men who, seeing that you can't be caught, attempt to buy a thing they know cannot be bought. Denna applauded delightedly. A plea of grace for enemies. I merely point out that you yourself are not above the giving of gifts, I said, as I myself well know. Her eyes hardened, and she shook her head. There was a great difference between a gift freely given and one that's oh. meant to tie you to a man. There's truth to that, I admitted. You're stupid. Gold You're stupid. can make a chain You're as stupid. easily as iron. Still, one can hardly blame a man who hopes to decorate you. Hardly, she said with a smile that was both wry and weary. Many of their suggestions are rather indecorous. She looked at me. What of you? Would you have me decorated or indecorous? I have given some thought to that, I said with a secret smile, knowing I had her ring tucked safely away in my room at Anchors. I made a show of looking her over. 
Both have their merits, but gold is not for you. You are too bright for burnishing. Denna gripped my arm and squeezed it, giving me a fond smile. Oh, my quoth, I've missed you. Half the reason I came back to this corner of the world was in the hope of finding you. She stood and held out her arm to me. Come, take me away from all this. Chapter 148 The Stories of Stones On the long ride back to Imre, Denna and I spoke of a hundred small things. She told me about the cities she had seen, Tinue, Vartharet, and Denevan. I told her about Ademre and showed her a few pieces of hand Is language. It? She Dude, teased me even, about my I growing fame, and I told her the truth behind the right stories. Now. I told her how I'm things bomb. had fallen out with the mayor, and she was properly Mostly outraged on my behalf. But there was much we didn't discuss. Neither of us mentioned how we'd parted ways in Severin. I didn't know if she had left in anger after our argument, or if she thought I had abandoned her. Any question seemed dangerous. Such a discussion would be uncomfortable at best. At worst, it might other, reignite like our previous system. argument, and that was something unlikely. I was desperate to avoid. Denna carried her harp with her, as well as a large traveling trunk. As long as they don't I guessed other, her song was finished, kills. and she must be performing it. It bothered me that she would play it in Imre, where countless singers and minstrels would hear and carry it out across the world. Despite this, I said nothing. I knew that would be a hard conversation, and I needed to pick the time for it carefully. Neither did I mention her patron, though what the café had told me preyed on my mind. I thought on it endlessly, had dreams about it. Felorian was another matter we didn't discuss. For all the jokes Denna made about my rescuing bandits and killing virgins, she never mentioned Felorian. She must have heard the song I'd written, as it was much more popular than the other stories she seemed to know so well. But she never mentioned it, and I was not enough of a fool to bring it up myself. So as we rode, there were many things unspoken. The tension built in the air between us as the road jounced away beneath the cart's wheels. There were gaps and breaks in our conversation. Silences that stretched too long. Silences that were short, but terrifyingly deep. We were trapped in the middle of one of those silences when we finally arrived in Imre. I dropped her off at the boar's head, where she planned to take rooms. I helped her carry her trunk upstairs, but the silence was even deeper there. So I skirted hastily around it, bid her a fond farewell, and fled without so much as kissing her hand. That night, I thought of ten thousand things I could have said to her. I lay awake, staring at the ceiling, unable to sleep until the deep, late hours of night. Jesus. I woke early, feeling anxious and uneasy. I had breakfast with Simon and Fella, then went to Adept Sympathy, where Fenton beat me handily three duels in a row, setting him in the top rank for the first time since I'd returned to the university. With no other classes, I bathed and spent long minutes looking okay. through my clothes before Regret deciding on a simple that. shirt and the green vest Fella said set off my eyes. I worked my shade into a short cape, then decided not to wear it. I didn't want Denna thinking of Felorian when I came to call. Lastly, I slipped Denna's ring into my vest pocket and set off across the river to Imre. Once at the boar's head, I hardly had a chance to touch the door handle before Denna opened it and stepped out onto the street, handing me a basket lunch. I was more than slightly surprised. How did you know... She wore a pale blue dress that flattered her and smiled winsomely as she linked arms with me. Women's intuition. Oh. Ah, I said, <laughs> trying to sound wise. The nearness of her was almost painful. The warmth of her hand on my arm. The smell of her like green leaves and the air before a summer storm. Do you know where we are bound as well? Only that you will take me there. When she spoke, she turned to face me and I felt her breath against yeah, the side of my neck. Old. I gladly leave my trust in you. He just like slid down I turned to face her, that. thinking to say one of yeah, the clever yeah. things I'd thought of last night. But when I met her eyes, all words I left me. I, the path on her for a lot, I was lost guy. in wonder. For how long, I cannot even guess. For a long moment, I was wholly hers. 
Dana laughed, jogging me from a reverie that might have stretched a moment or a minute. We made our way out of town, talking as easily as if there had never been a thing between us but sunlight and spring air. I led her to a place I'd found earlier that spring, a small dell sheltered by the backs of trees. A stream meandered past a gray stone that lay lengthwise on the ground, and the sun shone on a field of bright daisies stretching their faces to the sky. Denna caught her breath when we crested the ridge and saw the carpet of daisies open out in front of her. I've waited a long time to show these flowers how pretty you are, I said. He's younger than me. That won me an enthusiastic embrace and a kiss burning on my cheek. Both were over before I knew they'd begun. Bemused and grinning, I led the way through the daisies to the graystone near the stream. I removed my shoes and socks. Denna kicked off her shoes and tied up her skirts. Then she ran to the center of the stream until the water rose past her knees. Do you know the secret of stones? She asked as she reached into the water. The hem of her dress dipped into the stream, but she seemed unconcerned. What secret is that? She drew up a smooth, dark stone from the stream bed and held it out to me. Come see. I finished cuffing up my pants you know and made my way yeah, into the water. She or held up the dripping stone. Ten kids at twenty-one. Or if two. you hold it in your hand and listen to like it, two and a half, yeah. she did so, closing her eyes. She stood still for a long moment, her face turned upward like a flower. I was drawn to kiss her, but I resisted. Finally, she opened her dark eyes. They smiled at me. If you listen close enough, it will tell you a story. What story did it tell you? I asked. Once there was a boy who came to the water, Dennis said. This is the story of a girl who came to the water with the boy. They talked and the boy threw the stones as if casting them away from himself. The girl didn't have any stones, so the boy gave her some. Then she gave herself to the boy, and he cast her away as he would a stone, unmindful of any falling she might feel. I was quiet for a moment, not sure if she was done. It's a sad stone, then? Above me. She kissed the stone and dropped it, watching as it settled to the sand. No, not sad, but it was thrown once. It knows the feel of motion. It has trouble staying the way most stones do. It takes the offer that the water makes and moves sometimes. She looked up at me and gave a guileless smile. When it moves, it thinks about the boy. I didn't know what to make of the story, so I tried to change the subject. How did you learn to listen to stones? You'd be amazed the things you hear if only you take time to listen. That could be crawl, she too. gestured to the stream bed strewn with stones. Try it. You never know what you might hear. Not sure what game she was playing at, I looked around for a stone, then cuffed up my shirt sleeve and reached into the water. Listen, she prompted earnestly. Yo, Gibby. Thanks to my what studies with Elodin, I had a high tolerance for the ridiculous. No, no, no. I held the stone to my ear and closed my eyes. I wondered if I should pretend to hear a story. Then I was in the water, wet to the skin and spitting. Dude, why does it drop me short every time? I spluttered and struggled to my feet while Denna laughed so hard she doubled over at the waist, barely able to stand. I moved toward her, but she skipped away with a little shriek that left her laughing even harder. So I held off chasing and made a show of wiping water from my face and arms. Give up so easily, she taunted. Are you so sudden doused? I lowered my hand into the water. I was hoping to find my stone again, I said, pretending to look around for it. <laughs> Denna laughed, shaking her head. You'll not lure me in that easily. I'm serious, I said. I wanted to hear the end of its story. What story was that? She asked teasingly, not coming any closer. It was a story of a girl who trifled with a powerful arcanist, I said. She mocked him, and she scoffed at him. She laughed at him full scornfully. He caught her one day in a brook, and rhyming, he did quell her fears. And then the girl forgot to look behind her, and it led to tears. I grinned at her and pulled my hand out of the water. She turned in time for the wave to hit her. It was only as high as her waist, 
but it was enough to unbalance her. She went under in a swirl of dress and hair and bubbles. The current carried her to me, and I helped her to her feet, laughing. She came to the surface looking three days drowned. Not fair, she sputtered indignantly. Not fair. I disagree, I said. You're the fairest water maid I hope to see today. She splashed at me. Flatter all you like. The truth remains for God to see. You cheated. I used honest trickery. She tried to dunk me then, but I was ready for it. We struggled for a while until we were pleasantly breathless. Only then did I realize how close she was. How lovely. How little our wet clothing seemed to separate us. Like, bro, I just got, like, Denna I got seemed to realize it so at the same left. time, and we moved and a little apart like right from each other, each other, as if suddenly shy. What am I supposed to do there? The wind stirred, reminding us how wet we were. Guys are way before, Denna right? skipped lightly it's to the shore and boy. stripped away her dress Especially without a moment's hesitation, no tossing it over the graystone to dry. She wore a white shift underneath that clung to her as she made her way back into the water. She gave me a playful push as she passed me by then crawled atop a smooth black boulder that lay half-submerged near the center of the stream. It was a perfect sunning stone, smooth basalt, dark as her eyes. The whiteness of her skin and the two revealing shift were a sharp contrast against it, almost too bright to look on. She lay on her back and spread her hair to dry. Its wetness made a pattern against the stone that spelled the name so of the wind. She closed her eyes and tipped her face toward the sun. Valorian herself could not have been more lovely, more perfectly at ease. I moved toward the shore as well and stripped off my sodden shirt and vest. I had to be content with my wet pants, as I had nothing else to wear. <coughs> Yikes, dude, I keep sneezing what does that stone tell you? I asked to fill the silence as I laid my shirt next to her dress on the gray stone. She ran one hand over the smooth surface of the stone and spoke without like opening her God. eyes. This one is telling me what it is like to live in the water but not be a fish. She stretched like a cat. Bring the basket over here, would you? I fetched the basket and waded out toward her, moving slowly so as not to splash. She lay perfect and still, as if asleep, but as I watched, her mouth curved into a smile. You're quiet. She said, but I can smell you standing there. Nothing bad, I hope. She shook her head gently, still not opening her eyes. You smell like dried flowers, like strange spice smoldering, close to catching flame. Like river water, too, if I have any guess. She stretched again and smiled an easy smile, showing the perfect whiteness of her teeth, the perfect pinkness of her lips. She shifted her position on the rock slightly, almost as if she were making room for me. Almost. I thought of joining her. The stone was large enough for two if they were willing to lie close. Yes, Denna said. Yes to what? I asked. Your question, she said, tilting her face toward me, her eyes still closed. You're about to ask me a question. She adjusted her position slightly on the stone. The answer is yes. How was I to take that? What should I ask for? A kiss? More? How much was too much to ask? Was this a test? Oh, is these guys I knew I asking too much would only drive her away. I was wondering if you would move over a little. Dude, I it's said so gently. Hard to win now. It is yes. To fucking win. She shifted again, making more space beside her. Then she opened her eyes, and they went wide at the sight of me standing shirtless above her. She glanced down and relaxed when she saw my pants. I laughed, but her wide-eyed look of shock pushed me back into caution. I set the basket in the place I had thought to take myself. What thought was that, my lady? She colored a bit, embarrassed. I didn't think you were the sort to bring a girl her lunch while you were running stark. She gave a little shrug looked at the basket, at me. But I like you this way. Delete it. My own bare-chested slave. She closed her eyes again. Feed me strawberries. I was happy to oblige, and so we passed the afternoon. Lunch was long gone, and the sun had dried us. For the first time since our fight in Severin, I felt things were right between us. 
The silences no longer lay around us like holes in the road. I knew it had just been a matter of waiting patiently until the tension passed. As the afternoon slowly slid by, I knew plate. this was well, the I right time to bring up the subject I had been biting my tongue over for so long. I, would have taken it I could see sure. the dull green of old bruises on her upper arms, the remnant of a raised welt on her back. There was a scar on her leg above her knee, new enough that the red of it showed through the white of her shift. All I needed to do was ask about them. If I phrased things carefully, she'd admit they were from her patron. From there, know, it would be really a simple thing to draw her out, to convince person? her she deserved better, so that whatever he was offering her was not worth this abuse. And for the first time in my life, I was in a position to offer her a way out. With Alvaron's line of credit and my work in the fishery, money would never be a problem for me. For the first time in my life, I was wealthy. I could give her a way to escape. What happened to your back? <clears throat> Denna asked softly, you know, interrupting my train of thought. She was still reclining so on her stone. For the tournament. I was leaning against a, it, my feet in the water. That much. What? I asked, I unconsciously I turning much. a foolish half-circle. I'll literally pass out. You're scarred all along your back, I can't be she said like, gently. Maybe like 90 I felt sleep. one of her cool hands touch my sun-warm skin, I tracing a line. That, like, if you wanna, like, land here, I could hardly to tell they were scars back, at first. Probably what I'm going to do. They're pretty. Well, she traced land, another like, line down my back. Actually, I'm land on these four pills. It looks like some giant child mistook you for a piece of paper and practiced his letters we'll on you with a silver pen. I feel like everybody looks to the four she took her hand away, and I turned to face her. How did you get them? She asked. Huh. I caused some trouble at the university, I said somewhat sheepishly. They whipped you? She said incredulous. Twice, I said. And you stay there? She asked as if she still couldn't believe it. Hey, you don't get aimed, sister, After they did this to you? I shrugged it away. I find that to be one of the dumbest things in the game. There are worse things than whipping, I said. There's nowhere else I can learn the things they teach here. When I want a thing, it takes more than a little blood to... No way I'm denying that. It was only then I realized what I was saying. The masters whipped me. Her patron beat her. And we both stayed. How could I convince her my situation was different? How could I convince her to leave? Denna looked at me curiously. Her head tilted to the side. That was a good play. What happens when you want a thing? I shrugged. I was just saying I'm not easily chased away. I've heard that about you, Dennis said, giving me a knowing look. A lot of girls in Imre say you're not easily chased. She sat upright and began to slide toward the edge of the stone. Her white shift twisted and slid slowly up her legs as she moved. I was about to comment on her scar hoping I might still bring the conversation around to her patron when I noticed Denna had stopped moving and was watching me as I stared at her bare legs. What do they say exactly? I asked, more for something to say than yeah, from any curiosity. She shrugged. Some think you're trying to decimate Imre's female population. Dude, I can't see! She edged closer to the lip of the stone. Her shift shifted distractingly. Decimate would imply one in ten. I said, trying to turn it into a joke. That's slightly ambitious, even for me. How reassuring, she said. Do you bring all of them? She made a little gasp as she slipped down the side of the stone. She caught herself just as I was reaching out to help her. Bring them what? I asked. Roses, fool, she said sharply. Or have you turned that page already? Would you like me to carry you? I asked. Yes, she said. But before I could reach for her, she slid the rest of the way into the water, her shift gathering to a scandalous height before she slipped free into the stream. The water rose to her knee, just dampening the hem. We made our way back to the graystone and silently worked our way into our now dry clothes. Denna fretted at the wetness at the hem of her shift. You know, I could have carried you, I said softly. I swear, if I kill Denna one pressed the back of team, her hand to her forehead. Another like, seven words. I swoon. I swear to God. She to fanned know. herself with her other hand. What uh, should a woman do? Uh, no. Love me. Uh,
I had intended to say it in my best flippant tone, teasing, making a joke of it, but I made the mistake of looking into her eyes as I spoke. They distracted me, and when the words left my mouth, they ended up sounding nothing at all the way I had intended. For a fleet second, she held my eyes sorry, with intent tenderness. Then a rueful smile quirked up the corner I of do, her mouth. It doesn't matter when you, when you oh, kill somebody no, and thirst them. she said. Not that trap for me. I'll not be one of the many. Bring lab birds high, bring lab I clenched birds high, my teeth, stuck somewhere between confusion, embarrassment, and fear. I'd been too bold and made a mess of things, just as I'd always feared. When had the conversation managed to run away from me? I beg your pardon? I said stupidly. You should. Denna straightened her clothes, moving with an uncharacteristic stiffness, and ran her hands through her hair, twisting it into a thick plate. Her fingers knitted the strands together, and for a second I could read it clear as day. Don't speak to me. I might be thick, okay, 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 but okay, even okay, okay. I can read a sign that obvious. I closed my mouth, biting okay. off the next thing I'd been about to it's say. Like their whole team on then Denna saw me eyeing her hair and pulled her hands away self-consciously bad, without way. tying off the braid. Her hair quickly spun free to fall loose around her shoulders. She brought her hands in front of her and twisted one of her rings nervously. Hold a moment, I said. I'd almost forgotten. I reached into the inner pocket of my vest. I have a present for you. Her mouth made a thin line as she looked at my outstretched hand. You too? She asked. I honestly thought you were different. I hope I am, I said, and opened my hand. I'd polished it, and the sun caught the edges of the pale blue stone. Oh! Denna's hands went to her mouth, her eyes suddenly brimming, 